to go uh, back real quickly and, um, and review once again what, where we began last week as we defined what, what poetry is all about. Um, I, w I would rarely go to Webster's Dictionary, but this particular definition to me helps to, to focus on some of the things that are brought out as we really study Hebrew poetry. This is just a general definition of poetry. Poetry is writing that formulates a concentrated imaginative awareness of experience in language chosen and arranged to create a specific emotional response through meaning, sound, and rhythm. Now, there's a lot in that definition. As you may remember last week, we, we went back to some of the words um, within it. Um, what we discover is that poetry has various stylistic techniques to make it more concentrated, more focused. So you're getting uh, a lot of punch for, for the, the, little, the few words that you're having there. Are, there are various kinds of writing techniques that are making it more powerful. And we're going to actually talk about some of those a little bit later in the class today. So it's concentrated. It's more, it's more concentrated. There's a lot of white space that is filling the pages because the lines are sometimes much shorter. It doesn't mean that they're not saying as much, but they're much shorter. It also allows us as Christians or gives us permission as Christians, as believers in the Lord, to, to focus on the more experiential side to our relationship with God. And what we find in the in the literature that we call poetry is it often has elements that very much connect with our experiences. And I think that's one of the attractive things about poetry is those techniques seem to have an immediate connection with us much more than, than the history that we find in prose. And finally, there are techniques in the writing of poetry chosen and arranged in various ways, uh, emphasizing, and in this case we're talking about poetry in general, meaning, sound, and rhythm. We'll want to make a few exceptions for that as we talk about, about Hebrew poetry. And today, as we, as we go further then with this subject, what we're, really, what we're really looking at are some of the tools that you and I can learn about Hebrew poetry that are going to help us as we go on uh, to study the scriptures. Um, another way of saying this is you don't have to know Hebrew to appreciate many of the fe features of Hebrew poetry. The English text has retained many of those features and it really allows us to enjoy some of the things that are found in, in poetry. While I'm thinking of it, just a, uh, a word about the third hour session today. Those of you who are taking the class for three hours will be meeting in that session, but all of you are welcome. Even if you're only taking the class for two hours, we're gonna meet about 12.30 to one. Uh, 15 thereabouts and we're going to go even further than we are in our two-hour class uh, I'll, be, I'll be sharing some illustrations that I've used and that others have used in the tools that we're learning in our class now how does this practically work itself out in the way we prepare Bible studies if you're uh, in a preaching situation in your church in the way that you would prepare a sermon how do these tools what are some examples of how these tools have a very practical outworking in, in, in messages and in ministry and, and Bible studies and the way we go about it? So I think, I think you'll find uh, that third hour session to be helpful. I'm going to give you a lot of things that you can stick in your file and, and know that they're there and maybe some tools that will, um, will take you a little bit further today. We're especially focusing in the third hour today on Psalms and Proverbs, various ways to teach and preach from the Psalms and the Proverbs, which um, for me has been a favorite uh, part of, of, of teaching through the years, and I think probably for many of you too, as you learn how to do that. Now, I'd like you to turn in your Bible, if you would, to Exodus chapter 14 and 15. We have one of the best examples here of the contrast of prose and poetry. And uh, we, may have, we may have different versions. I've, I've just started about the last six months using the ESV. Is anybody else in here using ESV? Uh, I'm, I'm noticing about a split group between ESV and NIV, and then a few of you are using New American Standards. So uh, 
that's okay. That's not a problem in our class. Uh, I'll be, when I read, probably reading out of the ESV, but um, you'll be able to follow along, I'm sure. Could I ask someone to read in a good loud voice, if you would, uh, Exodus 14, the very end of the chapter, 26 through 31. This is a story uh, of the children of Israel after they've crossed the Red Sea, and I think you'll pick up the theme of it real quickly. Could someone read that out loud? Exodus 14, uh, 26 to 31. Sean, do you have it there? Do you mind reading that for us? Thanks. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come there upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horses. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea turned to its normal course. And the morning appeared, and the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea. The waters became a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so that the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Let me follow that up with these words in the very next chapter. Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to Yahweh, to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Yahweh, or the Lord, is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them, and he went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury, it consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have, have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew your wind, the sea, and covered them and they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. We're going to stop at that point. Um, obvious parallel here. We have a story told in narrative. And then the rare chance to actually hear a song. Whenever you run into the word song in the Old Testament, it simply means poetry. This is a poem, the lyrics to a song. Perhaps it was sung. There may have been music that was accompanying it. But a song usually refers to poetry. And as you can see, a beautiful poem that is, that is telling really the same story. Now, as you listen to those in close proximity, what are, what are some differences you see between narrative in chapter 14 and poetry in chapter 15? What are some things that you observe about chapter 15 that are a little bit different from 14? 
more direct, a uh, little, little bit more on that. Uh, I want to say Ivan. Yeah, Ivan. Um, expand on that a little bit. Facts. Okay, good. I think that's a good observation. It is like reporting a story for a newspaper. It is factual. And we find direct facts in contrast to what in the poetry? Yeah. Emotion is definitely there. The words generate that. Yeah. Calling on the reader, calling on the one singing the song to be rejoicing in this so that we have elements here of of, joy, of the emotion of joy and the experience of joy as a result of it all. Um, Caitlin, you mentioned experience in, in all of this. What kinds of things, and I'll throw this out to everyone, what, what kinds of expressions here help us to identify with an experience? Kind of, what kinds of words in chapter 15, for example, are connecting us with that experience? Yeah. 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 Yeah, there there are so many attempts here in chapter 15 to help us to visualize things. Throw you can picture God throwing the armies into sea. One of my favorites is um on that note is down um in verse 5. This is speaking of the Egyptian army. And it says, the floods covered them, and they went down into the depths like a stone. Uh, someone have an NIV? Uh, read that, because I actually love the way the NIV puts it. Yeah, verse 5. These waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Oh, I was thinking that um, there must maybe another version then. Um, the idea here is you can picture you can picture someone throwing a stone in and even though it'll take a little bit to drift down the stone is just sinking to the bottom the bodies now we're talking about the bodies of people are sinking into the bottom of the river or of, in this case of the red sea like a stone they sank to the, into the depths like a stone um, many expressions Verse 8, God blasts his nostrils and the waters piled up. I mean, isn't that an interesting image? That all God had to do is breathe and he was able to completely stop or completely divide the Red Sea uh, to provide a place for the people to be able to walk through. So we have expressions. Um, what, else, what else are you observing in chapter 15 that is typical or characteristic of poetry here. And how is it different from chapter 14? Okay. Examples. Okay, good. We're going to talk later about one of the most important ones that is used, and that is the metaphor. The metaphor is picturing God or picturing others in common terminology. We're using something that we can connect with in our physical world, and we're using it to picture this story, to picture God. So a part of the imagery that we have is the use of metaphors, of similes, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the techniques that the poet uses, various figures of speech that are used in poetry to help it to, uh, help it to be much more vivid. Um, another thing that's happening here that, and I, this really didn't hit me until really this reading at this time, um, and that is in, in chapter 15, there's a lot more celebrating going on. In chapter 15, it isn't just that the story is told, but we're regularly 
encouraged or called upon to worship God because of this. This is a rallying point. This is an ex there's an excitement that is being generated in this story. Uh, and, and the excitement is actually being generated with the poetry. The poetry is a technique of, of the writer to help us to, to visualize this. We will see a little bit later some of the techniques of parallelism. And you've already done a little bit of work in that, uh, in your reading and also in, uh, in the paper that you wrote for today. But parallelism is evident here where things are sometimes repeated. And the repetition adds emphasis at the right point. There's a lot of, uh, uh, of emphasis going on, of greater emphasis. Whereas back in chapter 14, and I'm certainly not minimizing the value of narrative, but narrative is really there to report history for the most part. It is intending for us to worship God, but it doesn't necessarily call on us to worship God. We're rehearsing a story, we're remembering a story, and in narrative, really, a good way to think of it is often the facts are being told, but not a lot beyond the facts. Uh, there's one exception that I, that I see, or, or, or uh, we don't often find this in narrative, and we, we read in, in this pas passage that it's really the God who is doing this. Um, let me read just the first part again of 26 and following. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back on the Egyptians. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled, notice this next phrase, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the water. Now that actually is an exceptional expression in narrative and in prose, because we actually have there a metaphorical way of viewing this story. Uh, we would not have seen, if we were there watching it, we would only have seen the movement of the waters and the waters coming together and the armies were thrown into the water. But in this case, it's identifying it's the Lord who is doing that. And that actually is much more of a poetic expression, much more of a metaphorical way of picturing what is happening here, that it's really God who threw the army into the, into the depths. Um, that those images of human bodies sinking to the depths like a stone are really powerful ones to help us to appreciate the... Um, the deliverance that God gives, that God gives to His people. Well, I think when you see poetry and when you see prose, you recognize differences. But we, we want to go now to a little bit more subtle analysis, and I, I almost, I almost hate to use that word. Um, if poetry is inviting us to experience something, then maybe we'll, maybe we spoil it when we try to analyze it. I'm not sure. I actually struggle with this a bit because a part of what we learn when we study Hebrew poetry is there are things that we can analyze. I'm going to give you uh, some tools today and next week we'll go on further to learn various things that will help us to analyze, that is to pick it apart, to look more closely at poetry, at the techniques, which this is what we're going to talk about right now, some of the techniques that are used in poetry. And I want to, want to remind you, uh, as we move along here, that the greatest way to experience poetry is not to stop with the analysis. Let the analysis become a tool only. Let it be a means to an end. But don't stop with that. Don't, don't analyze something and just let it lay there on the paper. Rather, after you've worked with the tools that you're going to learn, that you would put all those tools together and now just bask in, in, in the message of this poetry, that we're experiencing something together, that the poetry helps us to enter into an experience. One of my uh, Old Testament professors um, had great appreciation. For, in fact, in my early days of seminary, he probably gave me, for the first time, a love for the Old Testament that I had never had before. Dr. Ron Allen is his name. He teaches now at Dallas Seminary. And Dr. Allen used to say, when you're reading poetry, when you're studying poetry, 
you need to remember that it is not only what it says, but how does it say what it says? And, and that's, that's a profound way to look at poetry. We're looking at narrative and we say, well, what does it say? But when we move to poetry, we can also ask the question now, how does it say what it says? Because the very techniques that are used in the delivering of the poetry are intended to inspire us, they're intended to move us. They're a part of this emotional connection that we can have with the text of scripture. So going back again to something that we uh, introduced last week, poetry is related to experience. Um, there's a great debate as to whether Hebrew poetry significantly, significantly uses what we call meter or rhythm within it. And I'm, I'm really going to leave it at that in, in our class um, there is a lot that has been written in articles about the question of if we read the text in Hebrew, we are not in this class going back to the Hebrew directly. We are at times are referring to Hebrew terms. But if we read the text in Hebrew, one would have to have a, a very subtle understanding of the Hebrew to pick up on what we would call the rhythm or the meter. Now, there are some who say this exists but others, Tremper Longman being one of those, believes that it's rare, that we really do not find the same kind of rhythm that we find in other language, uh, poetry in other languages, such as uh, English poetry, and I shared an example with you uh, about, about that. The other element that is often found in poetry, what we commonly call rhyme, is putting together sounds that are gonna resonate with one another, and of course, not all Western poetry rhymes sounds at the ends of lines, but much of it does. And that's probably the, the most common understanding for most people of what poetry is. Roses are red, violets are blue, you know, the, the various common poems that we learn about rhyming of sounds, the ending of lines in, in good poetry in the eyes of some has some kind of rhyming of sounds. Well. This does exist to some degree in Hebrew. If we were to read the poetry in the scriptures, in Psalms and other places in Hebrew, that we would find some sounds that are intentionally the same. Sometimes even at the end of a line, those sounds are intentionally the, the same. But not always. In fact, in, in fact this, this raises a question. Because remember, the Hebrew text is being translated into many other languages so that the world, you and I can access it, even if we don't know poetry, the folks in our churches who do not know poetry, I'm sorry, who, who do not know Hebrew, are still going to be able to access the beauty of poetry, not because of the rhyme, but because of another technique. And this is, uh, this is the technique I ask you to do a little bit of work on, of thinking on today, and that is the idea of parallelism. We find in poetry often a paralleling of ideas or thoughts. What's beautiful about that is you don't lose it in translation. You can translate to any language that you want and you can still retain, you can still retain the thoughts. Um, I, I once uh, read an article about uh, Western poetry and especially Western poetry where the, the, the words rhymed at the ends of lines. And it was really humorous to read the article because someone translated it into another language, let's say going from English to French, and tried to maintain the rhyming of sounds. And basically it destroyed the poem. In order to try to pick just the right words that are going to sound exactly alike, you, you begin to move the meaning to something entirely different. And and so we realize what a challenge this is if we're only dealing with sounds. Because remember, God's word has been translated for us into whatever language we were, are reading it in. In our case, we're reading it in English. And rather than losing that, parallelism is, is retained. And this is a, a great help to us. So one of the tools that I want you to become skillful with, and hopefully you will use this tool uh, in the semester as you read parts of the books that we're going to be studying, 
uh, later on as you write your papers. And I'll comment a little bit later. Um, remember, um, we were going to leave a part of the syllabus to talk about today. One of those things after our break today I want to talk about is the various projects that you'll be working on. But one of the, one of the things that you'll find is a tool uh, that you will hopefully bring up as you write papers and do other things will be this idea of parallelism. What do we mean when we talk about parallelism? Well, put very simply, lines of poetry often are found in couplets, and for identification's sake, we refer to them as A and B. Sometimes, an even more extravagant kind of poetry puts a third line. I know some of you had a little background in Hebrew. Does anyone happen to know what we call when there are two lines of poetry together? A, a bicola. That's not like Coca-Cola, okay? That's bicola with a B. And then when we put three together, obvious, tricola. So we refer to, to bicola, which is a most common kind of poetry. For the moment, let's stick with that one, the AB the AB lines of poetry. So we're thinking of two lines of poetry that we'll see some examples in a moment that are together. Longman, uh, in his uh, chapters that you were reading this week, points out a very interesting phenomenon as we look back at the history, the history of viewing parallelism. Because remember, what we're going to claim as time goes along is that a and B are parallel to one another. Let's remove C here for the moment. That this bicola would represent two lines that are parallel to one another. Before 1750, and, and Longman develops this history a bit, before 1750, there was a recognition that these two lines were probably intended to say something different from one another. And that's what I mean by the... Uh, the summary there, A is not equal to B. So as, as poetry was read, the common way of interpreting is that when we come to the second line, we ought to be looking for something different here, a different meaning than the first line. Now, as time progressed, a scholar by the name, last name of Loth, L-O-W-T-H, and you'll find him referenced there in your reading uh, in Tremper Longman, uh, Loth propose what became what we might call the traditional view of parallelism. And that is the intent of the poet, the intent of the writer, to, when putting two lines together, is that they would, be equal, they would be seen as equal. A equals B. Rather than seeing them as different, they are seen essentially as synonymous, and that A is the same as B. Well. Tremper Longman, I think, representing probably the modern view, which is much more balanced, is, is going to a third option. And that is we recognize that there may be similarities, maybe even the two lines are identical to one another in their meaning. But in many cases, the second line of poetry, B, is advancing the idea further from A. And so his way of describing the modern or balanced view of this is taking the best of both worlds, as he puts it, sometimes a compromise ends up including the best elements of both. The balanced view of, of parallelism is that we do have something that is different in the second line of poetry, but it has some elements that may be the same. So it is advancing the thought further, and I think this will make a lot of sense and, and has made a lot of sense as we look at some examples of this. So let's do that right now. Um, I'm going to really use the screen more than, uh, more than anything else here. Uh, in a moment, we'll turn to some passages and look at some examples. The three most common kinds of poetry uh, are, are synonymous, synthetic, and antithetic. And I put in another term here that is sometimes used. So you're going to find synonymous parallelism is often referred to as a comparison. As a comparison. Remember, we're A and B 
we're talking about bicola here. What do we mean by a comparison? Well, the second line repeats or echoes the first line. So, great example, Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Anybody diagram sentences all the way back to high school or college? Any, does anybody do this anymore? I don't see any hands going up. I feel really in the minority here. I had a, I had a high school teacher who was so adamant that you had to really learn English, you had to learn to diagram sentences. Maybe some of you don't even know what I mean by diagramming sentences. Uh, diagramming sentences takes, it's actually a very structural way of doing things, a line, and you, you put the position of different words I'm sorry. Something like this. The subject, the verb, the object, those would be on the main line to show you this is the, this is the center of this sentence. Now, a lot of times we have all kinds of other parts of speech that are parts of sentences, adverbs, adjectives. So under nouns, when you diagram sentences, you would put a little uh, modifier under here, and you'd put your adjectives under here. Uh, under, under verbs, you'd uh, put adverbs and so forth. Uh, in many different places, you'd put what is called prepositional phrases, preposition like of, something. And when, you, when you're all done, you have this amazing structural analysis of a sentence. Um, boy, in that class in high school, I loved it, and, and it's partly because I came from a background where I loved analyzing things like that. A little bit of my engineering background, I think, uh, came through there, but diagramming sentences was very helpful to me as I went on later on in Greek and Hebrew, understanding how the different parts of speech were fitting into the structure of a sentence. So all that to say, what's going on in this kind of parallelism? Well, we have two subjects, the heavens and the skies. We have two verbs, declare and proclaim. Of course, these are English translation. In most cases of different Hebrew words, okay? The poet is choosing intentionally different Hebrew words as he writes the two lines of poetry. And finally, what we could call an object, there are some modifiers in here, but an object at the end of the sentence, the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. So, we have a bicola. We have synonymous parallelism. At least that would be my evaluation of this. Because... Essentially, the subject and the verb mean exactly the same thing. Very little ver difference. The heavens, the skies, declare, proclaim. Essentially the same thing. But we would have to acknowledge that the object of those verbs is a little bit different. The first line is claiming that the declaration is all about the glory of God. The second is keeping the focus back on the fact that it was God who created, and so the work of his hands would represent the things that he created in the, in, in, on, the, uh, on the earth, what we commonly call creation. Well, there's a lot of theology in this parallelism, because it would tell us that the purpose of the creation is to bring glory to God that the result of the creation is to bring glory, God, glory to God. In some ways, you could say that these are slightly different, but they are so close, especially the subject and the verb are so close, that most would place this bicola in, in the category of synonymous parallelism. Synonyms meaning the same synonymous parallelism would just be, would just be 
saying almost the same thing. We don't always claim it has to be exactly the same thing. But saying almost the same thing in two lines of poetry. Now, I won't go further with some of the detail here, but um, one of the interesting features of this, if, if you have the capability of studying the Hebrew words, and this is where Hebrew word studies come in very, uh, very handy, you're going to discover that the two different words that are used for the heavens and the skies, or the two different verbs that are used to declare and proclaim, there may be some points to be made about the choice of those. Why would the poet have placed these parallel to one another? Is he trying to say something more here? In other words, another way to put this is, is the poet just writing beautiful stylistic poetry, or does his choice of words go further with the meaning of what this bicola is trying to say? This is all a part of, of our analysis. But in the final, in the final um, result of all of this, we ought to stand back, uh, appreciate all the tools that we use, appreciate the things that we're able to do in, by way of analysis, but then just say, this is beautiful stuff. Never let analysis distract from the beauty of the poetry. That the poet was a master with words. He was able to express things in a way uh, that just involved a huge amount of creativity. And often in that creativity was even an intent of the meanings of words that were carefully chosen. As we go a little bit further and encounter different kinds of poetry, I'll try to point out how the poet's choice of words at times for us as teachers of the word can actually become exegetical points. The poet in his choice of words actually may be making uh, points for us that, that could be delivered in, when we preach this passage. And I think as we go along here, we'll see, a little, we'll see some other examples of that. Let me put these other two on the table, uh, and then we'll stop for a moment if you have, you have some further questions. Synthetic is a second category, sometimes referred to as completions. In this case, we do not think of the two lines as synonymous, but rather the second line is completing or developing further what was started in the first line. Good example, Psalm chapter 1, verse 2. But his delight, remember Psalm 1 begins speaking of the godly man uh, who's um, he's planted like a tree and so forth. By the, uh, he's grounded firmly. Speaking of the godly man, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Second line, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now these, these are, this is a bicola. These are lines that are placed parallel to one another. But notice, they're not saying the same thing. But they are saying something that's related to one another. The second line is helping us to understand more what is meant by the first line. What does it mean that someone delights in God's word, in Torah in this case? What does it mean to delight? Well. It probably means you spend quite a bit of time in it because you love it so much. Uh, in this law, he meditates day and night. It's, a, again, a figurative expression speaking of someone who's, whose life is really quite captured by the word of God. And that's what delighting would mean, that we spend time with it, that we enjoy it. Now, a third kind of parallelism, these are the most these are the big three. I would describe these as the big three. We would call antithetic, and these are contrasts. A and B, the bicola, are contrasted to one another. This is the easiest one to recognize. How do we always, how do we recognize, I would say, 99% of the time, a antithetic parallelism? What's What's the key word? But. Whenever we see the contrast with the second line beginning with the word but, or some kind of an intentional contrast, but in most cases it is that word, 
we can almost guarantee that this is going to be antithetic parallelism. For the Lord, again back to Psalm 1-6, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So we, we have this contrast of God's relationship with those who follow him, the righteous, and those who don't follow him, and what's going to happen to both of those. God's going to watch over some, but he's going to let some um, meet disaster. The wicked will perish. So synonymous, synthetic, antithetic, have I lost anybody? We're talking here pretty basic terminology now, because in a moment we're going to get into a few that are a bit more sophisticated. And this really reminds us, as we get a bit more sophisticated, that we need to appreciate the amazing ability of a David or another poet of the Bible and their writing. These were geniuses when it came to beautiful poetry. And, uh, and that's why when we, when we look at their techniques of writing, we're really quite astounded. But any questions on the synonymous, synthetic, antithetic? Does anyone remember from your reading what Tremper Longman says about synthetic? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh, Frank, he's uh, saying that it really isn't a helpful category. Uh, putting it another way, I think uh, Tremper Longman sees synthetic as kind of a catch-all. When you can't figure out what something is, you throw it into synthetic. And in some ways he's right. I would, I would claim that there are some really obvious examples. I think the one I had up here in a moment ago, Psalm 1-2, really does fit the picture here of synthetic because the second line explains more fully what the first line means, or at least it gives us an illustration. But I, I, I would agree with, with Tremper Longman in the overall treatment of poetry there are many things that are just thrown into the category of synthetic. And they really don't um, help, they're not helpful. Uh, not helpful in the sense of really understanding a little bit more what it's all about. So the two that probably would be the, the greatest uh, use, the greatest and the most obvious ones that we could identify for sure are synonymous and antithetic. And I would want to leave open, synthetic has its value, but we really have to define a little bit more what we mean in each case by that. Uh, other, other question, any questions that you have on these three? So we don't want to leave anyone behind here. These are going to be categories that I hope you will get very used to using in your uh, research, in your writing. Well, let's go on just to add a few uh, examples. Emblematic. Psalm 42.1 is a great example of emblematic. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. Now here we have something very similar to the figure of speech called a simile. If you remember back again to English classes, maybe for many of us in high school, a simile is identified when you see the word like or as. Usually we are dealing with a comparison of some sort. An emblematic parallelism is really an expanded simile. It's not one word like or as something, but it is a, a whole picture that is being painted for us. And uh, in this case, it is trying to understand, uh, trying to appreciate um, how much our inner soul really desperately needs God. And the poet is wanting to say this in a way that really connects with the folks. And a little bit later, I'm going to show you a picture of where David probably wrote this. Every summer when I take a group to Israel, I have a chance actually to go back to En Gedi, which is a retreat from this barren desert of the Dead Sea area. And you go back into the, into the hills and very, quite suddenly, you're into a very lush green area. Uh, you find some of the most beautiful waterfalls in Israel. Back in this area, there are streams that are flowing. And many believe that Psalm 42 was written 
uh, seems to reflect David's experiences because in Gedi was a retreat for him where he would often run away from Saul. Uh, in his later days as king, he retreated into En Gedi from the wilderness. The wilderness would be the dry, barren areas that almost have no water at all. As the deer pants for streams of water, wildlife everywhere in En Gedi, and even in David's day, we would assume that he had seen a deer coming out of the desert, coming up the valley, coming into, in, uh, into the streams of water. And that, that deer is desperate for nourishment. The wilderness dried him up. And he's using this picture as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. One of the phrases is a word of comparison. It's trying to help us to understand the the unfamiliar and the more uh, obscure ideas by connecting them with things that are very tangible and things that we can see. So David here is wanting to picture our desperate need, the desperate need of our soul to be, to be nourished, to be refreshed by God. And he does it by an image that he would have regularly seen, that people would have known very much in, in his day. Again, key word like or as will introduce an emblematic parallelism. Oh, here was the picture. I couldn't remember where I uh, threw it in. Uh, this is what En Gedi looks like. And uh, David would have retreated. In fact, uh, several stories that happened likely in this very valley. You can see off to the right some of the stone the stone that is there. There are many caves that are found here. And most believe the Saul, uh, the story, in fact, we know the story of when Saul is uh, with his men in the cave, remember, and David is um, hiding away in the cave. And a uh, rather funny story, actually. Uh, Saul is relieving himself. He's going to the bathroom in the cave. And David gets so close to him that he actually cuts off a piece of his robe, which he will later use to show Saul... Saul, I could have killed you. Here's a part of your robe. And uh, that story takes place in En Gedi also in this, same, in this same valley. But beautiful, lush greenery, waterfalls, just a short distance away, less than a mile. You're out into the wilderness, into the Dead Sea, absolutely dry. So this is, this is a great place to illustrate. David uses this to illustrate some of his um, images out of the Psalms. Uh, another more um, obvious one is repetitive parallelism. And this is Psalm 29.1 as a great example. Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Did you ever wonder why there's so much repetition in Psalms? Well, it's actually a poetic technique. In many cases, the repetition is there for emphasis, and often the uh, way that it is written is intended to um, br bring the emphasis at the appropriate places. Um, obviously, this is encouraging us to ascribe or to give to the Lord honor for the glory and strength that he has. As ascribe to the Lord or give to the Lord glory and strength. But it's introduced with a line that is not completed and then goes on to complete it. So the repetition is obvious in, in this uh, kind of poetry. Now we're getting a little more sophisticated. Uh, a type of poetry called pivot, the pivot pattern. A word or a clause which stands in the middle of a poetic line. And it actually is intended to be read with both the one that precedes and the one that follows. So, an appropriate way to read this passage is recognizing that the words to the nations are to be read twice. The Lord has made his salvation known to the nations, and to the nations he has revealed his righteousness. So we have here a poetic technique again, and the use of the same words that are actually going to serve a dual function in the bicola in each of the lines of poetry. We call that pivot poetry. Some of you have studied languages. Greek is a great example of this. 
are used to the idea of chiasm. It comes from the Greek word, uh, the Greek letter chi, and very simply, chi in visually is like an X, a crossing over, a chiasm intentionally orders the words in sentences and then switches them around and makes them go the opposite way. So, Psalm 1, verse 6, and actually verse 1. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Notice in this sentence, and, and here we get a little more deeply into the analysis of the sentence structure. By the way, the examples I'm giving here are worded like this with this order in Hebrew also. And that's an important point. Sometimes, as I'll point out in a moment, our English translations change the order of words a bit and we actually lose some of the parallelism. But in Hebrew, this, would, this translation would reflect the way that it's written in Hebrew. Notice, bringing emphasis again to a contrast. So we have here antithetic parallelism. The word but is here. But the position of the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked are on opposite ends of each of the lines. The poet intentionally placed it like that, again, to, bring, to draw attention to this. The Lord watches over, and the words will perish are going to come at opposite ends as well. So the chiasm is just an intentional technique uh, by, the, uh, by the writer. It would certainly be considered stylistic. We would consider this beautiful poetry. It takes a lot of skill to write poetry like this. But we would also make exegetical points from it to say that probably his intent here is to contrast righteous and wicked. The way of the righteous, the way of the wicked. And he does that using a chiasm. In other words, placing them in the opposite positions. Here's a more complicated uh, chiasm or chiasm. Uh, back uh, again, verse, verse 1 of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man. And now we're going to launch into a series of situations. Not just two, but here we have a tricola. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now here's a great example where translations have smoothed this out and we lose the chiasm. Because you, you, you'll recognize that this verse is translated in most translations who do not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful. That's not how it is in Hebrew. In Hebrew, we actually have intentionally the word order changed around. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or in the way of sinners stand, or in the seat of mockers sit. Again, probably the intent is to show us here, to draw our attention to the words that are chiastically placed on opposite ends of, those, uh, of each of those lines of poetry. The wicked, the sinners, and the mockers are the uh, focus of all of this. And we could even go a lot further th with this to, to show that the words that are chosen are actually, they seem to be showing even a progression of getting sucked into a way of life, into a way of life that is going to be away from God. If you think about it for a minute, in fact, a case could be made as you look at these Hebrew words, the wicked, the sinners, the mockers, they actually are progressively moving to a more serious opposition of God. The wicked would be a more general term that would refer to those who live a life that is away from God. The sinner is a stronger term in Hebrew. And then finally, the mockers would be not only those who practice things that are not of God, but they actually make fun of others who follow God. In, in addition to that, and that's why this is such a sophisticated uh, these are sophisticated lines of poetry. As if, if you've noticed, and some of you have, have heard this or noticed this, the progression of the verbs, walking and standing and sitting. 
would indicate someone who is perhaps, perhaps casually entertaining the thoughts of another way of life, that would be walking. But now standing would indicate that he's actually stopped and pondering this pretty seriously. And finally, you have, you have the one who is away from God now is sitting among the mockers. He's actually one of them. He's actually participating in everything that they do. Blessed is the one who doesn't live a life like this, who makes intentional choices. And so you see in these lines of poetry an actual progression that is indicated of someone who is, uh, the warning here is to stay away from a life that would gradually suck you into this opposition of God. It's a beautiful way of expressing it in, in Psalm 1.1. Okay, um, I, want to, I want to look at one last uh, feature of poetry, and that is the, the figurative expressions that we find within Let's it. Let's talk a little bit as we close today, our two-hour session, talk a little bit about the, the imagery that we find. One of the characteristics of poetry in the Bible is proportionate to prose. It has much more concentrated use of imagery and figures of speech. And that's for a reason, because those, Im that it, those images and those figures of speech are attempting to connect us in a very real way experientially with the uh, points that are, that are being made. Now, I brought along today, and where did I put it? Oh, here it is. Some of the tools that are available on this uh, kinds of things. Uh, this is both good for weightlifting, uh, but it's also a, a great resource. Um, there are two other books that I could have brought that are much older on the subject of biblical imagery and figures of speech. But this one, I forget the exact date on it, came out a few years ago. Uh, Tremper Longman is actually one of three general editors of this. Just an excellent resource, the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery. And as you can see, it's very thick. It does not... It not only deals with the books that we're looking at, but actually deals uh, with uh, biblical imagery, especially throughout the Old Testament. And uh, you're going to find in here a wealth of information about different kinds of images, different kinds of figures of speech. Um, I've used this many times just as when I've run into something to look up something very quickly. And it, it's, it's a wealth of information. So a dictionary like that, a dictionary of biblical imagery, can be really Helpful. But let's talk about some of the things. I'm going to go over several of these very, very quickly. Um, similes, again, the use of like or as, a figure that makes a formal comparison of one thing with another. We've already encountered some of these before, but let me read once again in Psalm 1. Verse 3, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. He's like a tree, not just any tree, but a tree that is planted by water and so forth. So the, the imagery here of comparison of the godly man and, and characteristics about him, I think a valid study of this would take us into the question, what is a tree like that is planted in a barren land next to a stream? And out of those characteristics, we could validly carry on over some of the spiritual qualities of, of a man or a woman who follows God. Uh, things like stability, continual nourishment, those kinds of things in a spiritual sense. So again, we're understanding the the uh, spiritual life by looking at physical elements, physical images. Same with metaphors. It's a figure of speech giving implicit comparison of one thing with another. And I think many of you are aware that figures of speech, this figure of speech, I should say, does, makes an obvious analogy, but it does not say that it's like something. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, 
I have to admit that even though I grew up on a farm, I really didn't fully understand that image until I did some reading about it. Um, we only raised cows on our farm. I was never around sheep. I was never in a, in a culture, in an environment where there were shepherds. And many of you have heard enough sermons, maybe done some reading to know that the life of a shepherd is really a quite a unique story. Um, so expositors and, and uh, those who give us backgrounds to scriptures, uh, an example of Philip Keller, an older writer who was, he himself was actually a shepherd. He has written some excellent short commentaries on Psalm 23 and in the New Testament on the Good Shepherd. Remember, Jesus likens himself to the, as the Good Shepherd. Uh, so as we, look at, as we look at these metaphors, in this case, the metaphor is what, it, what is it to be a shepherd to sheep? And implicitly, we could even go further than, if the Lord is our shepherd, then that means we're sheep. What are sheep like? Well, that's another whole story. <laughs> Uh, if you've ever been around sheep, and I must admit I've been in a very limited way, if you've ever been around sheep, you know why God shows them as a picture of people. They are flighty. They are scared of the least uh, noise or influence around them. And one of the funniest things about sheep is they follow the leader to the nth degree. Sheep will choose a leader or however they do it, and it doesn't matter where that leader is leading them, they will follow that leader. It's just like human beings. We are so vulnerable. And unless we have a shepherd who intelligently is leading us, and remember, with my cows, I used to drive a herd of cows from behind, but a shepherd leads sheep. And there are shepherds today in Israel who illustrate that, that whole point for us. So what am I saying is sometimes appreciating a metaphor might mean doing some reading about the cultural background of that metaphor because many of us don't have enough background with some of the biblical metaphors and that's why commentaries and other resources can be really useful here for us. Hyperbole, another way to say exaggeration. Now some people are bothered by this. I'm not bothered at all. The Bible exaggerates sometimes, but when it exaggerates, we know that it's a, a technique of writing to make a point. Let me use an example. David says in Psalm 6, 6, in his lament about his, um, his depression and the things he's going through, he says, I am weary with my moaning and every night I flood my bed with tears. Now if we take David literally, he's waking up in the morning and there's a puddle of water all over the floor. Well, we know that that's not literally true. But that expression, we, we just inherently understand it, don't we? We, he, we flood our bed with tears means he cried all night long. But there's an intensity about this. So a high Hyperbole in the scripture is obvious exaggeration to try to make a point. Now, here's one that is debated, but I'm pretty, I feel pretty secure in this interpretation. When Jesus said that we should be very careful about lusting, he made a statement that one of the church fathers, Origen, actually took literally. Remember when Jesus said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Did you know that the church father Origen actually plucked out one of his eyes? That he took that to be literal? Now, I appreciate the devotion that he had to God, and he wanted to obey Christ, but I don't think we have to do that. If your eye offends you, take drastic action. Don't minimize the significance of this. Take drastic action in your life. It doesn't necessarily need to be taken literally. So hyperbole, when we run into it, should be, by most at least, understood to be a figure of speech. And there are other examples, sometimes debated examples, but there are other examples that I think we can find uh, of, of hyperbole in Scripture. 
anthropomorphism. A big word which just means that God pictures himself in the physical form of human beings. This particular figure of speech has to do with the physical form. Let me turn over to Psalm 10, verse 12. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. We, we find this often, in fact, so often in the Psalms that you probably read right over this and you do not, you do not think about the fact God doesn't have a hand. But often his actions are pictured or his intents are pictured with physical body terminology. Um, his he raises his mighty arm to deliver Israel. He lifts up his hand. And in fact, there's an interesting one where he turns his face on some, but there's a fear of the psalmist and others that God will turn his back on others. Now this could be taken literally if God were a physical human being, but obviously he's not. So the picture of all of this anthropomorphism is to help us to visualize what God is doing in a spiritual sense. Describing God through physical bodily characteristics. There's another type of, um, uh, of uh, connection with our human experience, and it's called anthropopathism. And here we have God described through human passions and feelings. And, and sometimes there is a debate about some of these as to whether this is actually intended uh, to be about God. Uh, Psalm uh, 6, verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. This is, this is a borderline one. Because we know that there's a righteous anger. And we know that God is a God of justice who can pour out wrath. But the psalmist is calling on God not to rebuke him. If we take this in a human sense, we could picture two ways that God might discipline. And we know only one of them really is the way God does it. I, I experience this as a father. I don't often experience it as a grandfather because I hardly ever discipline my grandkids. <laughs> It's just what the way life goes. But with my kids, I wanted to make sure that when they had disobeyed, that my reaction to them was not one of my own personal anger. Now, it's not that I wasn't angry at times or frustrated as a parent, but I wanted to make sure that when I carried out discipline, that they knew that I loved them. And in fact, um, my daughter, uh, showed me when she was a little girl that somehow that message had gotten through pretty well. I remember one of those memories, kind of a Kodak moment that you think of. I snuck up on my two daughters. They were only one year apart, and maybe, maybe five years old, six years old at the time. And they were playing with their dollies in one of the bedrooms. And I snuck up and, and eavesdropped on, on them. Uh, and one of them had taken her doll and she had put it over her knee and she was, she was starting to execute a spanking. <laughs> I think she even had the wooden spoon, <laughs> which in our house was kind of a symbol. It was like the rod in Proverbs. I don't ever remember, maybe once or twice, ever actually using the wooden spoon. It was general. Uh, it was a symbol of something. But it definitely got the job done as a symbol. That's all that was needed. Uh, well, she had gone down to the kitchen, I think, and gotten the wooden spoon had her dolly over her knee, and she was saying to her dolly, now we want you to know that we're doing this because we love you. <laughs> and she was getting ready to do her spanking. It was one of those moments I'll never forget because as a parent, what I'm hearing is, hey, <laughs> the message really got through. She is connecting discipline with love. And I think a part of the terminology that's used here in Psalm chapter 6 is attempting to do the same thing. Lord, don't discipline me in your anger, but rather discipline me because of your love. So 
granted, there's a borderline here that because we know that God can have a righteous anger, but the carrying out of discipline, especially of his own children, the psalmist is, is, is connecting with our human experiences. I think the intent here is to connect it with a father who either disciplines in anger or who disciplines in love. And the psalmist is asking God to discipline him, not in his anger, but in his love. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.